Hello, I'm Dapper Dan Gavostin, and I own every issue of The Amazing Spider-Man, including the annuals, which definitely count. Welcome to The Amazing Spider-Talk, the show where two fans and collectors uncover the strange, fun, and fascinating history of the Spider-Man comic universe. So thank you guys for joining us for this bonus episode of The Amazing Spider-Talk. And this is going to be a little bit different than we normally do, because this time it's just me but I'm not really going to do this entirely on my own. In fact, I've invited on my good friend Brad Gullickson from Twitter and the Comic Book Couples Counseling Podcast. Uh, welcome to the show, Brad. Oh, it's so thrilling to be here. Longtime listener, first time caller. Well, I'm also a really big fan of your show, and I'm really happy to have you on. Now, the reason we're having you on today is, you know, you've been posting on Twitter these amazing images um, from this Steve Dicko exhibit that you went to seemingly over the weekend, and I just couldn't get enough of them, and I figured if I can't get enough of them, my listeners are going to want to hear about this. In fact, I know some of my listeners even went to the exhibit, but I figured why not bring on one of my podcasting friends here, and we could talk about your experience at this thing. So, so Brian, before we get into it, first of all, tell us a little bit about your podcast, and then tell us a little bit about what this exhibit was. Sure, absolutely. So uh, Comic Book Couples Counseling is a podcast that I do with my wife, Lisa. And what we do every week is we pair a comic book couple, they might be iconic, they might not be so iconic, with a self-help guide, uh, a self-help book. Because we are not love experts, we've been married for 14 years, but we are not doctors, we do not have a PhD of any kind, uh, so we need a love expert to help us. And we started the podcast with Scott Summers and Jean Grey of the X-Men, and we paired uh, Gary Chapman's The Five Love Languages with them. And what we discovered early on is that in, uh, in, in dissecting these relationships, using these self-help guides, one, we got a better understanding of these characters, uh, but more importantly, we got a better understanding about ourselves. And we were able to kind of use these comic stories as a bridge to discuss our own uh, issues and struggles as a couple. And it's been a lot of fun. We've been doing it for two years. We've covered Mary Jane and Peter Parker. We've covered uh, uh, Miyamoto Usagi and the Lady Tomoe from Usagi Yojimbo. And right now we're covering Dinah, Lance, and Ollie Queen, Green Arrow, and Black Canary. And it's just a, a total blast. I just want you to spend a whole season on Peter and Deb Whitman. That's, that's what I want. <laughs> that, that's the kind of healthy relationship modeling I'm hoping to, to get on your show. Uh, no, yeah. you guys are great. Yeah. You're so much fun on your show. And you have such a knowledge of comics like Beyond Spider-Man and... Uh, and, and I just like kind of learning about these characters that I haven't really spent time with. And it gives me a little bit of an understanding of them. And, um, you know, as a, as a married person myself, there there's always some good advice in there, too. So it's a lot of fun to tune in. And, and I'm glad that, I, you know, we discovered each other mutually because I think it's been a fun little online relationship um, to, to have. Um, so uh, the, it, great. Thanks for sharing. And I hope some of my listeners come and check out out your show. So, so, so Brad, tell us a little bit about this exhibit. Like what the heck was this? I'm saying Steve Ditko. Why am I so amazed by this? Tell, tell me about this exhibit. Well, so it is the hometown heroes exhibit in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Uh, it took place in this art space called bottle works. And I, you know, I've never been to Johnstown. I knew it was the birthplace, the hometown of Steve Ditko, but it was never like a destination spot for me. But they put on this um, sort of mu museum tour of Ditko's life, and it includes all kinds of rad memorabilia. Uh, and we'll get into it, all the goodies that they had. Uh, but I had a friend who is actually one of the workers at the Four Color Fantasies bookshop, and he went and visited. And I always meant to go, but... The days kept getting away from me, and eventually it's, it was starting to close. My friend's like, you've got one day to come to Pennsylvania to experience this exhibit. I highly recommend it. So put your life aside and go. And that's what I had to do. I had to go on a Friday. My wife was working. We're a one-car family, so I had to call my dad up and beg him for the car. 
uh, and rather than giving me the car, he wanted a road trip. So the two of us drove 171 miles from Virginia to Pennsylvania to go to this exhibit. And, you know, as I told my dad, look, this could be a total bust. They could have like one or two interesting things, or it could be a great time. Who knows? So you just have to like put your faith in that you're going to see something interesting. And uh, thankfully, we got up there, uh, took about three and a half hours, and uh, it was awesome. It was way better than I expected. Yeah, I mean, looking at the photos, not only did it seem like very, um, I mean, kind of intimate, right? You could really experience all they had to offer on like a really one-to-one scale, you know, in a way that, you know, a major museum wouldn't really offer, but also that just had so much stuff. I mean... Yeah. Especially for someone like Steve Dicko, uh, I know that he doesn't like the word recluse, but you know he mm-hmm. wasn't very public forward. He was very much a family man, you know, with the kind of like intimate with the people that were part of his life, right? And this would like yeah. you, you don't really get access to the, anything of Steve Dicko within the public space, and suddenly it seemed like you were getting like you opened the door and all the stuff you've been missing all those years just, just tumbled out on you. Um, so tell us a little bit about the experience of like getting in there and seeing truly what they had to offer. Well, I mean, it was an emotional experience, you know, as we approached the building, you could see in the window, you know, t-shirts with Mr. A on the cover and like a little ink pot and Steve Ditko's name on those shirts. And you're like, oh, wow, they're really, they're really celebrating Steve Ditko. This is, this is wild. And then you walk in and the first thing you notice are the original art pieces on the wall. And that's, you know, it's astonishing to be able to put your nose almost to the glass to, to really observe the ink work of Steve Ditko. Like that in itself is, was worth the trip, but it's the family photos that I was not really expecting to see. And like you said, you know, the reputation for Ditko is that he is, you know, a standoffish and he's a very private man and, you know, you know, all the power to him. He deserved his privacy. Uh, but but you you kind of like build an image in your head as a fan based on, you know, the Jonathan Ross documentary in search of Steve Ditko and things like that. And these uh, letters that pop up online every now and again. And here I was in an exhibit that had his high school yearbook that had army photos, that had photos of him with his family, with his nieces and nephews, and he's laughing. And there's this one photo of him holding up a songbook, and he's like in mid belting of this song. And it's this joyous expression from Steve Ditko that I had never seen before. And it really just showed you how, you know, Steve was a human being and he he contained multitudes. And he knew profound joy. He wasn't just the bitter uh, Ayn Randian obsessive. No, he knew love. He experienced bliss. And here it was in these photographs. And thanks to his nephew, Mark, providing these images, like here I am in this this museum with my father and I'm I'm crying because I get to see the Steve Ditko that I never imagined. I mean, one of the images that I saw first was this image of Steve Ditko's own pens, his like ink ink pens. And, you know, they're not behind a display case or anything. They're just sitting there. And, you know, first of all, it makes me like anxious, you know, because I, I, you know, in my mind, Steve Ditko, like everything of his would be behind glass and displayed in wonderful fashion and held with the utmost reverence and you know that's not to say that like this experience shouldn't have happened but it makes me scared that theft might occur you know or something like that and you know i think a lot of people have discussed that kind of idea when when he passed which is like his stuff was not terribly well documented so you know where it might end up is anybody's question um so what was that like i mean even just seeing a tactile tool of his just like laying on a table before you. I mean, it was weird. Uh, you know, I had the same thoughts that you had, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, there was no security guard present. It was when, when my dad and I arrived on Friday morning, we were the only two people in the entire space. Wow. 
And, you know, we talked to the person at the desk. She was incredibly friendly, uh, was very excited to see us. And then we were just let loose upon the exhibit. And, you, you know, the, the you see the art on the walls. And I went there first. And then you look down and that's where I found the pen set. And, you know, they're caked in ink. They're well-loved, well-worn. And, you know, th these things were instruments to Ditko's genius. And yeah, like Indiana Jones says, these things belong in a museum. <laughs> uh, and, and and you want them, you, you want the world to understand how uh, powerful these are. These are totems of power uh, for, for someone like me. Uh, and, you know, if this was an exhibit in Washington, D.C., where I live, uh, they probably would be behind bulletproof glass. Right. But because it's in Johnstown, they have a faith in their community and their faith of their guests that they're not going to do anything brash. And some of the things were under glass. I mean, they had his like army camera there under glass. They had his yearbook under glass, but then they had his coat hanging up that you could touch, you know, and I mean, it's just it's a it's a weird experience and it's an emotional experience. Did you wear his coat? Uh, I put my arm in it. <laughs> I, I did put my arm in it. And, you know, like, I also have that thought, like, should I even be doing this? Should I be putting the oils from my fingers onto his radio? Um, but they were there. I was there. We had to occupy the same space, given the opportunity. I couldn't help myself. This image of like his desk, you know, uh, it is really striking. There's like these drawings of of characters that he seems to be working out on on his uh you know on his pages i guess what kind of um experience did you have in terms of getting inside of steve dicko's head from this i mean did, did you get a sense of his working process how he existed in a space from from this kind of thing uh, i i don't think i could necessarily say that i could get that psychological with it I do think when you put his pieces up together in one giant room and you go from images of Mr. A to like that one Superman pinup that he did, and they had a whole wall of his Chuck Norris karate commandos art wow. that, uh, that, I, that I did not take a photo of, but you start to look at his heroic faces and how they all kind of have like – Blankness is not the right word, but, you know, after his stint with Marvel, like his characters, his heroes in particular, all had a very like stern, heroic expression, like a very determined, confident stare. Um, and and I felt like he was definitely saying something with with his visages now. What do I get from looking at those drawings on that desk? I was in awe of those drawings on the desk because I could not really tell if those cartoon images were indeed Steve Ditko's. Mm. And I wish there had been an expert on hand. You know, like I know Mark Ditko was around there somewhere and they were bringing in cartoonists and they like Carl Potts was going to be there on the day, but I never saw Carl Potts. And I would have liked to have talked to some of those experts about those pieces in particular, because they do not look like Ditko's classic hand. They are very cartoony. Mm. They look like Ruby Spears era uh, animation cell drawings. Um, so I came away from that that piece, th those images on that desk, very curious and with a hunger to know more. Um, but yeah. Well, that, that gets to, uh, I think, another question, which is like, where did they procure all of this material? I mean, was it truly, you know, donated by Mark Dicko or did some of this come straight out of his office? I mean, how much of this is like what Steve Dicko still, you know, existed around? Yeah. So I, I, I was, had all those questions and I asked the, the woman who was there and, and she said that she knew that Mark Ditko provided a lot and that the family itself provided a lot, the Ditko family. And when the exhibit initially opened in July, uh, the, like the entire Ditko clan came down to Johnstown, Pennsylvania and had like a little reunion. So family members and cousins who had never seen each other or who hadn't seen each other for a very long time, 
kind of used this party event to reunite. And I thought like, well, how great is that? Yeah. You know, Ditko still bringing the family together. That's amazing to hear. And so I imagine that they are pulled from multiple places. Now, like the desk, if you look at that, there's a radio on the desk and it's like a retro radio. It's, it's, it's a CD player that's kind of done up to look like a fifties radio. So it's not a ancient device. It's a pretty modern thing. It looks like it's from the early aughts actually, but there's an address label on the top with Steve Ditko's New York apartment mm. address on it. And then to the right of that, where the code is, there is like a shelf and on that shelf are cassette tapes are DVDs and they're all history based. They're all education. It's like, you know, uh, a presentation on the declaration of independence. And there were some Ayn Rand cassette tapes on the desk and things like that. So it felt like they were lifted from some space, but you know, you also get this in your head, like, well, could this be fabricated somehow? Mm. Like based on the idea of like, I know Ditko was into Ayn Rand. Let's go find some vintage cassettes and like really make this space look like a Ditko space. Uh, so I, you know, I, I definitely want to know more about how it all came together. And I'd like to know the origin of all of those pieces, if they truly were from, you know, the corners of Steve Ditko's apartment, but that address was there. It did look worn. They did look like they were from the, the drawings did look like they were from the hand of Steve Ditko, even if they looked slightly different from what you've normally seen. Now you recognize the address. Is that because you've ever reached out to Steve Ditko? Cause like I have a Steve Ditko letter personally. Oh, do you? I do, yes. Oh man. No, I wish I did. I wish I did. I knew the address because I started tracking those things down after I saw the BBC documentary in search of Steve mm. Ditko. And I wanted to know where did Neil Gaiman and Jonathan Ross go to? Uh, and so that's how I had that information. Uh, what did you, what did you write? And then what did he write in response? If anything, oh, well, I will get it right now. Oh, please do. Oh my goodness. I don't know that I've ever read this on the show before. So um, you know, this will be interesting. I certainly haven't heard. It. Um, so I basically wrote to him about, uh, you know, kind of the standard boilerplate thing, like, you know, um, that, you know, his stuff was a part of my formative years and how much that character of Spider-Man and, and his work meant to me. Um, and I asked him about his like more recent work uh, publishing with Robin Snyder um, because you know, I had been keeping up and, and being participating in those Kickstarters, those very strange, small Kickstarters. You know, you have a mm -hmm. comics legend and like a hundred people kickstart those things. And you're like, uh, where are the thousands of people, you know, kickstarting Steve Dicko stuff? But um, and I asked him, you know, kind of like what his inspiration was um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and his and I guess his like kind of creative approach. It was a long, long letter. And, you know, and awesome. he wrote me back. He said, uh, Dear Dan, this is, um, uh, by the way, this is November 28th, 2017. So not, oh, not wow. very long uh, before he passed. Um, so he said, Dear Dan, comic books are still being published today. So a lot of buyers, readers find some writer, artist style that they have to enjoy and follow. So I guess that's addressing like, that he doesn't feel very particularly special that I love his stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, acknowledging that like, that's a thing people do. Uh, <laughs> so mm -hmm. he says, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Robin Snyder who publishes his comics newsletter has to be given credit for me getting to do the 32 page series. So this is talking about his new Mr. A story that he was doing at the time. He said, I never kept any kind of record of what inspired me in quotation marks or directed me to one area or another. The one thing in doing comic books is that the past work is re irrelevant. As a freelancer, mm. my focus is on, quote, what next, question mark, end quote, regards Steve Ditko. Um, which I thought was Fabulous. wonderful, you know, because it, it's so dry. It's very him. Uh, you know, he really doesn't want to take credit for anything particularly. Although, you know, he, I'm sure he wants to take credit for the things he feels like he's credited for. And um, uh, I liked his whole, like, I'm a freelancer, so what's next is really what I'm curious about. And um, one, I think that's really healthy. Uh, and, and two, I think that's like 
so Steve Ditko. So here it is. Yeah. There's my letter for Steve Ditko. Um, so were there some letters there that you got to see? Did, did people have letters there? There were letters there and they were all from people who came from Johnstown. And so it was like, you know, uh, there was one very long letter. Uh, I can't remember the gentleman's last name and I probably shouldn't say his last name, but his first name was Bruce. And he wrote this three page, like, like just loving letter, this, this letter of shock and surprise to learn that where he was from, so too was Steve Ditko. And he just, he, he, he wanted to thank Steve Ditko for his work on Spider-Man and how much of an influence Spider-Man had on his life. And, you know, if they were ever in town together, if Ditko ever came to uh, Johnstown again, that they could have lunch. And Ditko's response, which they displayed right next to the, the first letter, it starts off, dear Bruce, no lunch. <laughs> <laughs> And then it goes into, um, you know, and y y you can see this on my Instagram at mouth dork. Uh, but it, it talks about how this letter in the letter, it referenced an article uh, written about Steve Ditko. And Steve Ditko took a lot of um, he was frustrated with the point of view of the, the journalist who wrote this thing. And he pointed out all the mistakes that are present in that interview. And, uh, you know, it addresses Stan Lee. Uh, because apparently in the article that this guy had referenced in his letter, it said that Stan Lee was a creative artistic genius and Ditko responds, no, Stan Lee editor. Uh, and so I liked that uh, as a longtime Marvel Comics bullpen fan. Um, but there was another letter, which I didn't take a photo of, that sort of echoes the sentiments that he wrote to you about how it's nice that you like Spider-Man, but that's the past. The past is dead. The future hasn't happened. You got to work to the future. You got to live in the now and work for the now. And like you said, that's healthy. And I think that is something that I am trying to do in my own life right now. Lisa and I were actually talking about it on our latest uh, Green Arrow Black Canary episode about really cherishing the moment. And really, the moment is all that matters because that is what you're living. And so, like, I found a little connection with Steve Ditko there, too. So, yeah. Well, that's really nice. Well, hey, you know, on that note, this is a weird transition. But, you know, Spider-Man, like, the the, yes. the the topic du jour of, of this show, um, you know, as much as Steve as mo says he moves on, you know, he's famous for his, you know, uh, he, he wrote, like, these manifestos about how he created Spider-Man um, and it wasn't Stan Lee. It, it's not the idea. It's the execution. Was there evidence of any lingering thought about Spider-Man present at this exhibit? Like uh, any Spider-Man memorabilia that showed up there that might be, wow, that's something I never thought I'd see. So I didn't take a photo of it, but across from the desk and the coat on the other end was a wall of Spider-Man memorabilia. And I really wish I had taken a photo of it for you guys. <laughs> uh, but it was like all the different Spider-Man toys and puzzles and knickknacks that have been made since the creation of the character. And you, you have like Randy Bowen busts, you have bubble bath uh, bottles, you had chairs in the shape of Spidey's face. And then they also had like a bunch of Doctor Strange stuff too, like toys and action figures and the latest like Diamond Select stuff and the Marvel Legends Hasbro stuff. And, and, you know, speaking of like, you know, wanting things under glass, a lot of those Randy Bowen busts I would love to own, but cost quite a penny. Right. And here they are at, at kids level reach. And I'm like, oh, don't touch that vulture. You're going to knock it over and break it. Uh so I, I could have taken all of that home with me. And so it was like the, the exhibit, they weren't foolish enough not to, sh the, to make Spider-Man front and center at this exhibit. Um, and uh, yeah, so, but the, the only issue with that is they didn't really have a lot of like personal drawings or sketches or pages related to that character because those have all been gobbled up. Oh yeah, for sure. And you know, it's funny cause it's, that's almost like the most like Steve Dicko rolling in his grave kind of, kind of thing. I, that all that merchandise, but, um, but there, but there you yeah. go. 
There you go. So, <laughs> yeah. so um, like final thoughts on the exhibit itself, because I know you had some journeys outside of the exhibit. Um, you know, yeah. uh, any any final thoughts, things you saw that you want to mention or uh, feelings you felt? Well, there was like, well, there are a couple things I, I want to make aware uh, that I haven't taken a photo of, but there was a, f uh, a newspaper article from the Johnstown Tribune. Uh, I didn't get a date on it, but it must have been like 1950, 1951. And it was published in the paper just after Ditko had graduated from veteran school. So he had done his three years in the army and he was over in Germany. He comes back home. He goes to this veteran school and he studies illustration there. And in that newspaper article, it's all about like uh, Johnstown's own Steve Ditko, uh, most likely to succeed is the title of the article. Yeah, I'm looking at it and right it, it now. Comes, yeah. yeah. So it comes from a paragraph where the principal of this school says, like, I think there's a strong future for Steve Ditko. He's most likely to succeed out of the class. He gets all A's. <laughs> they mentioned that Steve Ditko gets all A's and, you know, he's studying cartooning. He's studying sign painting, uh, house painting. Uh, and then at the very end, uh, they, the last line is, um, it says it right here. He says, he says yeah, he would it. like to draw a comic strip. Right. And so, you know, I'm already a blubbering mess because that, Tribune article is on the opposite end of this collage of family photos where he's singing and laughing and having a great time. And so I looked at all that and then I turn around, you see this image in this newspaper of a young Steve Ditko and he looks like Peter Parker. You know, it's it's Peter Parker on the page right there and it says he would like to uh, write a, cart a comic strip. And you know, he not only does that, he creates one of the most iconic characters uh, ever. Uh, and he achieves that goal that he had in 1950, whatever. And it's just a miracle to see that. That's incredible. What a, what a story. Uh, and, 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 and then, else? yeah. Well, so in that article, they have an address to his parents' home in Johnstown. And when we got done with that exhibit, we're like, well, dad, let's go drive over. It's like two blocks. Well, you sneaky little. Let's go take a look at it. And, you drive up this big mountain because like where the bottle works is it's like in this arts district of Johnstown. They're trying to transform this little area that used to belong to all the miners. You used to go to the steel mill. And, and, and what's cool about that area of Johnstown is it's broken up into chunks where this is like the Polish community. This is the Romanian community. This is the Russian community. And so there's this real international flair in this tiny little square piece of Johnstown where the art exhibit is. And then you just go right up the hill and that's where the property where Steve Ditko grew up. And the house that's there looks not super new, but it doesn't look like it's from 1950. Yeah. It looks a little more modern. So it probably got, you know, built up. That's probably not the house that he grew up in, but that is the plot of land where he spent a lot of time. And I, and I'm the type of like person, I'm not a superstitious person. But when I walk a place of a creative, I get some kind of connection to that creator and to the art that has meant so much to me since I was 11 years old. And it was just a hell of a thing to be in that space where Steve Ditko once occupied. Wow. What a, what a beautiful sentiment. Um, what did your father get out of all this? So my dad is the guy who bought my first comic book for me, but not because he was a comic book fan. He, he was a sports guy. He's a baseball guy, mostly. Uh, and when we moved to Virginia and I had to get all new friends in sixth grade, fifth grade, uh, I had a miserable time until my dad took me to a comic book store in Burke, Virginia, Joe Gumbinger's used books and comics. Um, and I went in there, I was a cartoon kid. I was a movie kid. I bought a GI Joe comic and I bought a RoboCop two movie adaptation comic. And that sent me on a journey to where I am today as a comic book aficionado. So I owe my love of comics to my dad, taking me to Joe Gumbinger's shop in Burke, Virginia. So when I call my dad up, like, Hey, let's go visit this artist. 
you know, he doesn't take much con- convincing. He's retired. He he loves to go on an adventure. Uh, he was happy to do so. We watched a little bit of, or we listened to a little bit of the Jonathan Ross documentary in the car on the way up. And he became really interested in Steve Ditko. And he, of course, like everybody, really gravitated towards the division between Stan Lee and Steve right. Ditko. Uh, and, and so my dad, when we were walking through the exhibit, anytime there was like some reference to Stan Lee and possible tensions between the two, he really like was fascinated by that. But my dad's also a military guy, so he loved all of Steve Ditko's army badges and his army camera and the, his pen set and all that stuff too. So we came out of it, and my dad and I, like we we had a great time together. It was a great father-son trip. And I sent him a link to some more Steve Ditko stuff for him to read later. Well, that's so awesome. What a, what a great thing. I mean, it's one of those butterfly effects. Your father probably had yeah. no idea that 30 years ago, him like flapping his wings and taking you to that sh- store would end up with him in the middle of Pennsylvania, um, d- driving around to find some random house. Um, and yep. watching his son cry while walk down the street. Um, yep. but, uh, you know, that that's how these things happen. And, uh, I, I think yep. that's really great and something beautiful about that. Yeah, absolutely. And he commented on that too. Like, you know, uh, I, you know, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, my dad never quite understood my fascination with, uh, film and comics to the extent that I had, but he never said no to any of that stuff, even when, you know, like I would want like some of maybe the, like the more naughtier comics. He always would buy me the comics as long as we discussed them. And uh, so now uh, he listens to the podcast. He's a patron of our podcast. Oh, wow. uh, he still doesn't, you know, read comics on his own, but he's he's bought into his son's passion. And he's very happy that I have become the nerd that I have. Uh, and that delights me to no end as well. Wow. Well, that's really awesome. So, I mean, thanks again for coming on the show to talk about this. I just wanted to know more and you've really, I'm so upset that I was not able to attend this, what sounds like a really special event. Was there any indication that they would be running this kind of thing again in the future? Not from bottle works. Although I heard some rumblings like that. Mark Ditko wants to bring this stuff on the road. So that's possible. I hope that they do. I would like to see more exhibits that celebrate these creators. You know, like I, I think about like what a treat it was to see Steve Ditko, but you know, like, like let's have the Jack Kirby version. Let's have a John Romita version. Like let's really celebrate and find ways and opportunities and spaces to appreciate this art that obviously has a tremendous impact on where we are as a culture today. Well, I agree with that uh, wholeheartedly. I I don't know if you had a chance to go to the the Marvel uh, superheroes exhibit yet. Not yet. Uh, It is coming to Ohio. It's coming to Columbus, Ohio. So I'm probably going to do another road trip and I'll probably get my dad to go with. Well, I can't recommend it enough. And uh, this I hope we get to see again and that some of our listeners get to go and uh, and see all this kind of wonderful stuff that you saw and maybe even stock that house. I'm not going to ask you for the address, Brad. Um, (laughs) So but what I will ask you about is like if people wanted to follow you. Uh, well, where, where might they do so? Uh, well, you can follow me on all my social medias at Mouthwork, but I'd encourage uh, everyone to check out comicbookcouplescounseling.com, uh, at CBCC Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. Come hang out with my wife and I. Uh, we, we provide a celebratory, enthusiastic environment for all comic book fans and all the characters. There's, there's no character that we don't love. And if there's a character that we don't love, it's just because we haven't covered them yet. So we're looking for recommendations of couples to cover. Please let me know. Yeah. And this is, I'll say this is, this podcast is a great way to bring other people in your life into comics. Like I could think of no more welcoming environment for people to do so. Um, especially based on the topic, everybody can relate to like love and significant others. Um, you know, I say that because I think my podcast is like, it's not gatekeepery, but it is like really niche. And so don't, I would not play my podcast 
for like your new significant other you're trying to get into comics, I would give them Brad's. So uh, oh. I, I, I want to encourage people to, because I'm all about spreading the love of comics. And uh, so I, I hope people do take the time to check out your show. Dan, that means the world to me. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Brad. Uh, so, of course, let's wrap this all up. And, Brad, you're going to get to do the duties with me here. So, uh, yeah, this episode, as always, was uh, edited by Rick Coast with production support from Andy Myers. Our artwork comes handcrafted by artists Ron Friend, Sal Buscema, and Ray Sumzer. Brad himself provided the photos for us for our video version. And our theme songs were produced by Rylan Bojack, Tony Thaxton, and Spider Madge. So, Brad, until you get lost chasing after the homes of other famous comic creators and get a restraining order from Sal Buscema himself, what's our motto? With great podcasts, there must also come the amazing spider talk. Too many who know the angles, uncover and untangle all the questions and the webs left out to tangle. Be in 1962, last Wednesday's afternoon. They'll bend